Okay, I'm here with Liberty Elman. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to say before we start that if you're interested in more content like this, please go to my Patreon page, Guitar Unlimited, or subscribe to the YouTube channel for the Alternative Guitar Summit, because there's a lot of great conversations and music with master players like Liberty. You flatter me. <laughs> <laughs> So we've known each other for many years, probably since the early 90s, and um, there's so much we could talk about, but we've decided to focus on two things. And one is the music of Henry Threadgill, which you're very much involved with, and also some rhythmic stuff, which you're very, very good at. So Try. Let, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's start with Henry now. He's sure. been getting a lot of um, press. His autobiography just came out. Obviously, he's garnered many awards over the past few years. Um, I've been listening to his music since the 80s, and you've been playing with him since 2000? That's about right, yeah. And that's a pretty unique perch to be in as a guitar mm -hmm. player because his music is unlike any other. Certain demands and challenges that... Um, you have managed to take on and prosper mm -hmm. in that environment. So I'm going to just, I'd like to just try to pull back the curtain a little on what it's like to play with Henry. Yeah. Because his music is so unique. So talk a little bit about, for instance, the, the music you're playing. You're about to do a concert. Yeah, we're playing at the Spoleto Festival next yeah. Tuesday. And so we're preparing some stuff. Uh, a lot of it is from the record that uh, we just did called Poof. Um, P-O-O-F. Poof, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I mean, Henry, so everything is a, is a poem. You know, even one word can be a poem when, when you uh, apply it to his stuff. And uh, his titles are always something that people talk about, you know. Yeah. But, um, but there's, you know, he's had this very steady, prolific, volume of material based on his ideas uh, that he's been working. I mean, the core of the music and what makes it work has to do with his sense of melody and his rhythm, you know, which is just like all good music. It has to feel good and it has to have an underlying strength in its emotional core. And, and Henry really does have that, you know. But then he builds on that foundation with um, his own system, which has to do with these interval collections that that he builds his harmony from, and then we use those to navigate the voice leading and all that. And that stuff is, you know, people talk about that, and it's interesting. And it, it what what it does is it creates a certain kind of harmonic world that is unique to to this band yeah. and to his music. But that isn't what makes the music work. You know, that's yeah. just the way that he generates the music and mm. the way that we navigate it. But. Um, Really, when you say something like pull back the curtain, you know, what I often wish people could hear are when we're rehearsing these pieces because we break it down to the core and we're playing, you know, it's, we often, I often describe it as sort of like being in a chamber ensemble when we're dealing with the actual written material because everybody has a specific line and sometimes we're doubling melodies and a lot of times we're doubling certain kinds of rhythms, but they all fit together in this mm. lattice that is super funky that maybe brings Henry back to his days of being in great bands or what, you know, wherever yeah. he gets a sense of groove, but it's always there, you know? Right. Um, and so, you know, we'll just work on one bar of music at a time and just make sure that every rhythm is really hitting in the right way. And it's so ecstatic and funky in the way, even if you were playing a James Brown piece and the way you feel when you're just playing some seriously funky music. Yeah. When we just zero in on these bars and we'll play them for 20 minutes, Mm. And I'm just like, man, I wish people could just hear this because mm. it's so ridiculously obvious how good it is, you know. Right. And a lot, what happens is um, we do that and we do the work, and then but then when we play the gig, we just play all of those bars as a piece, right? And then we go into the solos and the whole thing. So like, you have to, you know, it can go by the average listener could just go right by you, yeah. You know? And you don't, and like, you know, you just heard something. You're like, wait, what was that? But it's gone, you know. You, trying to grab it, but we're on to the next thing, you know? So I know, you know, it's not always obvious to the listener what's happening, but that's why the music works, I think, because we put a lot of energy into making the, the feel of it, you know, uh, 
really strong. And, yeah. yeah. Well, when I heard Zillow the first time, mm -hmm. I did feel like I was listening. And I'm just going to get you to come a little closer oh. to me so your head isn't. Sure. I'm, I'm leaning. I'm like yeah. leaning back on the side. Um, uh, I I definitely thought about James Brown, which had hadn't occurred to me that much mm -hmm. in listening to Henry before, because the interlocking, the aspect of the interlocking rhythmic parts is so powerful mm -hmm. in his music. And reading his autobiography, I learned a lot about. You know, as you listen to that, um, like along with so many other things, and in the moment when it was being created, right. because he's that age, right, and. Um, so I guess I have two questions. One is, I wonder if you would ever consent to having a rehearsal videotape. I know, I know that would be interesting. I've, I'd often thought, you know, yesterday we were rehearsing that complete music and the bad plus we're rehearsing next door. And, uh, we were talking with, um, Dave and Reed outside before and they were just like oh man i want to peek my head in on the rehearsal and see what's going on you know like, <laughs> yeah. and so uh, there were certain times when we were hitting something and i was like oh this would be a good time for those guys to come in right now right. And this, you know yeah. um but uh they were also they were rehearsing like they have 15 new tunes or something for a record they're about to oh. record so they were pretty pretty busy in there. Yeah. but um but yeah i don't know i mean there are recordings, you know, like people have like, we've had our phones out and recorded some things, you know, but um, it would be interesting to do an open rehearsal sometime, maybe, oh. you know, maybe that could be a part of something. Yeah. But Henry, you know, like he, he's interesting. I mean, I think like a lot of great musicians, they often dismiss the value in some of that stuff, even though we can all see it, you know, because right. they say, ah, you know, you have to do your own thing. What do you care about how I put it together? You know, you don't want to know how the sausage is made. You just want to eat it, you know, it's just like... And, and it's not it, true, but I mean, but that's what he'll say. Like, you know, people yeah. want to ask him about his system and he doesn't really want to talk about it. Cause he's like, I don't want people to try and use my system to make their own music. They need to make their own system. You know what I mean? I get it. So it doesn't mean that there wouldn't be, we know it would be obviously great for people to be able to sit down yeah. rehearsal and just see how we put it all together. It would yeah. be super fun. Well, yeah. so when you first started, how hard was it for you to, to solo? Because, you know, we're used to looking at fairly conventional chord changes as jazz musicians. And this was like, okay, here are these pitches and then these pitches are changing. And then the meter is changing right. from bar to bar. Right. So what was the learning curve like for you? Were there a few agonizing moments of like, oh, God, I don't know if I can do this? There were. I mean, yeah. Because when I first, when we first, when I first did the first rehearsal and he, he'd given me music a few days before but because I hadn't ever worked with him and I didn't know how all the parts fit together I didn't really realize that he approaches it in sort of a chamber music structure just in terms of the way the parts work so my part I wasn't sure what I was looking at you know sometimes I would play through the part and it was really um I was starting you know just getting initiated into this rhythmic language that he uses and that wasn't so hard, you know, but it was just like, I, I, you know, I couldn't really memorize it that easily because it was kind of moving and mm -hmm. all this stuff. And so, so, and I didn't hear the other parts and I didn't really know, uh, what it, what it was I was preparing, you know, yeah. but when we hit that first rehearsal and I heard all the other parts together and we start playing and then I was just like, Oh, you know, the clouds were parted. <laughs> it's just mm -hmm. like, Oh, I get it. Okay. I get it now. You know, like there's this rhythmic counterpoint thing that's happening yeah. and uh, so that wasn't so hard but soloing like you asked that was a challenge because the harmony is not conventional and if you go in there with vocabulary like jazz general kind of jazz or bebop licks or anything like yeah. that it just doesn't fit it just sounds corny you know because yeah. it's just not the way the you know the rhythm like you say there's changing meters and your lines aren't going to land in a certain way there's not guide tones in the same function, yeah. the way your vocabulary works. So you have to, I had to build my own new vocabulary to deal with that music mm -hmm. in using the the intervals and dealing with the type of harmony that he, you know, understanding what my, not shortcuts, but what my um, techniques would be to navigate those charts <laughs> as a soloist. Mm -hmm. And I would say, it, I feel like I'm still working on it 20 years later, but I mean, it, you know, it took a couple of years, I think, for me to feel like I could improvise freely 
where I was really just sort of dealing with the chart, but also improvising a lot. Yeah. So in the beginning, I think I was really focusing on making sure I was hitting everything the way I could. Yeah. And, you know, not always successful, but I mean, that's what I was trying to do. So, yeah, so, I remember I was, I hung out, I remember pretty early on in that, I was hanging out, uh, I did a gig and Ben Monner was on it with Josh Roseman. And I was talking to Ben about it and I was like, man, this is kind of like the hardest stuff. And he's like, well, what's so hard about it? And I was like, well, it's just knowing what to play when you're improvising. <laughs> it's like, you really have to do a whole new thing, you know? It's, yeah. Um, well, so if there were, <clears throat> let's think about one practical thing. Like, let's say somebody's interested in expanding their horizons in that way. And if I'm listening to you and I don't know you, I'm thinking, well, okay, what if I set a comp compositional or improvisational challenge for myself? Like, I'm going to have one bar of 5 4 that contain these five pitches. And then one bar of seven four that can bot that have these four pitches, and I'm going to loop them, and I'm just going to force myself to stick to these pitches and create something in there without my usual vocabulary or licks. Is that does that come close to something that <clears throat> your average person could practice? Yeah. Well, sure. I mean, look, you can always create exercises out of anything you know like i'd be on the subway and listen to the way the subway tracks are like going underneath do -doom, uh -huh. boom do -doom, bat, boom do -doom, do -doom, bat, boom and you're like whoa what is that you know uh -huh. and then you say oh, oh it sounds maybe you know i don't i'm just making it up but it could be oh that's a bar of five and a bar of four and uh -huh. just doing this thing and then so you know to me to create an exercise to strengthen that would be at first academic i would just sit down and write the rhythm out mm -hmm. and so i would pay attention and you know like what is the rhythm that i'm playing over so my part isn't just an abstraction it's against something you know and now there's all these great apps like avi's uh metronome which you can uh it's called time guru right have you mm -hmm. played with that at all I have. and it's great because <clears throat> you can do mixed meter stuff and dotted rhythms and you can have you can program something or you could do it in a DAW like logic or something mm -hmm. if you wanted but like create a structure of that rhythm that you're trying to be stronger at mm -hmm. if you say five and seven and nine whatever it is and play your part is always with someone else's part you know mm -hmm. what I mean it's like it's like being in a, a drum ensemble right I mean I think Steve Coleman would talk about that you know like where all the rhythm chants in the music they all relate to each other and if you're not paying attention to everyone's part you can't really be settled in your part either yes right just like playing funk music right you yeah know, we talked about you said james brown same thing mm -hmm. you know so you have to learn to listen to what's happening and not just pay attention to your own thing so mm -hmm. what you're playing i mean if you're writing some kind of a line it's not really how different the line is you can be doing that with regular jazz vocabulary too you know you can put people play all these standards in odd times yeah so you know take something, put it in an odd time, whatever vocabulary you feel comfortable playing on it, but if you don't know how to play in these odd rhythms, force yourself to loop a section of the piece in odd rhythms and play the vocabulary you do know how to play. Yeah. But make sure you're really listening to the time, right? you know, and not just focusing on how cool your lick is, because I think that's sometimes we fall into that trap where we're trying to build our vocabulary, but we're forgetting the rhythm in context of the other musicians. Yeah. That's, that's where we fall off because then you know and I, and I teach a lot of college kids who have varying degrees of experience with that and I take it for granted sometimes someone gets frustrated when they're trying to stay on the groove and they drop a beat or something and mm -hmm. you know so we talk about subdividing the rhythms you know just breaking it down into fives and I mean threes and twos or whatever yeah you know, and finding what's comfortable in the music that relates to the subdivision and just relax, you know, yeah. just don't do so much. <coughs> yeah. You know what I mean? But, uh, so, so, but you take it for granted, man. I've been playing this kind of stuff for so long that I, you know, it was hard for me to, to learn it first, yeah. you know? Um, um I'm going to definitely come back to that, what you just talked about with rhythm uh -huh. with maybe some demonstration, but, but before I do that, just in terms of, um, Henry's legacy and all, what, what do you think, from the insider's point of view, what is it about his music that makes it so unusual and special from 
the player's perspective? I mean, it's a humongous question, you know, like, yeah. but, but, um, in a sort of abbreviated way, I would say number one, he is someone who has that completion gene. And what I mean by that is that he gets an idea and he makes it happen. You know, mm -hmm. like he has a thought and he puts it down and you can't underestimate, um, how important that is, you know, um, and lots of people do that, uh, but the thing is, is that his ideas are reflective of his personality and his interests. And he's an art person. He is an artist through and through. So he sees mm. things where other people don't see things. Mm. Shadows, shapes, humor, you know, darkness, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And he's able to harness all those things and, and put that in his music and create these moods, you know, and, and mm. lots of successful musicians do that, but that's, I think for him, um, every note has value. He plays, mm. that's like what I love about his sound. Mm. And I think he writes music to accommodate that, you know, mm. so his notes are really big and his soul is in there, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, what, you know, without Henry, the music would still be interesting and a lot of his chamber pieces and larger works where he's not even playing are great pieces of music, you know, but I think that he developed the way he hears music through the way he also played it mm. all those years, you know. And and then also there's that thread of creativity and individuality coming out of Chicago with the AACM and all that, that mm -hmm. you can't overlook. All of those people in that scene had a history of making their own either devices or systems. Yes. And that's something that the New York scene is a little different. Like, you know, some of that's, you know, we can discuss that too, but that, you know, most of it comes out of bebop innovations or like certain harmonic innovations, yeah. people like Thelonious Monk or after, you know, mm -hmm. Strayhorn or whatever, like adding on this certain shared body of work, whereas all these people really created individual ways. Yeah. That was just what they did. So Henry was is like them in that way. Including Steve Coleman. From of course, including uh, Steve. Yeah. But I mean, look, look at, you know, without a Muhal. Yeah. And, they, you know, they all have their thing. But, but... So from being inside of it, what makes it really different is that when you play mostly with other people who are not dealing with systems like that and it's more conventional jazz structures and harmony, mm -hmm. um, it's really striking like how different the music is because mm -hmm. for example, you know, there's always exceptions to this, you know, because there's just so many great musicians out there doing great writing. But Henry will write his melodies, and the reason that you have these different rhythms um, oftentimes have to do with just where the melody falls, you know, and so he's writing the melody, and the melody might be a five-bar phrase, or a five-beat phrase, rather, then the next one is a three-beat phrase, you know, and so then he'll have that, and then he might say, oh, I'm going to structure the harmony a certain way, but then he might want to give the drummer a different, you know, he might give the drummer the three first, and then the five-beat rhythm after that. Uh -huh. And so we're, you know, so we have accents in a different place and automatically it gives it this sort of unusual yeah. downbeat in the middle of the bar mm. that some of us are playing, some of us aren't, you wow. know, and so you multiply that by like 20 pieces, so, you know, it's like, it's like you start getting this interesting um, collection of rhythms in everybody's parts. And then, um, and then the way he works with form so different you know um how so well you know uh the simplest way to say it would be that he likes to workshop the music and so you come in with a piece of music and it says a b c d you know and you've got your stuff and we'll learn all the parts you know we'll learn them one bar at a time because it's sometimes it's really complicated locking 16th note mm -hmm. or quintuplets or whatever so we really have to practice the bar by bar to really get the rhythms right mm. and then he might like something that he hears and say, oh, you know what? I think for the intro, we're just gonna play these two bars, you know, but not with the melody part on top. Let's just hear what the mm -hmm. rhythm section is doing. And the rhythm section, you know, would be like the inner parts of the harmony or whatever. Yeah. And we'll play that and say, okay, drum solo. And then we're, we're playing our parts, the drummer soloing, you know, he said, that's what we're gonna do first, you know? And then, then we'll go to the B section before we play the A section. Let's just go straight to the B and we'll play that. Then we'll go back to A, and you solo in yeah. A. And then at the end of your solo, we'll play the head at A. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. And this kind of stuff will come out in rehearsal. And that's not, you know, usually people come in with a piece and this is how the piece goes. And there's no and you read time down. to release. Like you guys rehearse, you guys actually always spend days rehearsing, which is unique in jazz. Well, these days. Yeah. At least. Yeah. Well, in you know, days. <laughs> well, so, so you're right, but, and it's too bad, you know, and the economics of jazz have a lot to do with that and the way and the, but the way we approach the music i mean a lot of people well, chamber like, music too i mean sure. you don't get well or you know yeah rehearsal with I mean, that either. i mean i can't speak for what everybody's doing but i can yeah. say that with henry if you're in a, a long-term project um you know it's been 20 years now you know you're in a band it's like being in if you're you know i'm just naming bands it's, you know it's not the music isn't similar but like if you were in radio ed mm -hmm. it wouldn't be weird to hear that they were rehearsing three nights a week you would, yeah. you would expect that Right? Is their music that hard? Not necessarily, but like they're, they're creating a world of sounds. Yes. So they have, they're committed to it. And mm -hmm. so if you're playing in Henry's band, you sort of have to, I've heard other musicians who have worked with Henry say you sort of have to buy into it. Mm. You know, you have to believe in what he's doing yes. and want to be there. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've been in rehearsals and di lots of different projects where, where there was time involved and sometimes, you know, either economically or just people are busy and they start going, oh man, you know, so many rehearsals. Yeah. You know, people have limited time sometimes. Sure. But everyone who's been a member of this band um, loves it. You know, like, I, what would I rather do? Right. Would I rather be rehearsing with Henry or at home watching Netflix? Yeah. You know what I mean? Of course. And it's like, yeah. I'm working with one of the brilliant minds of modern music. Yeah. Or, you know, I mean, you know, I have kids. I, you know, it's like, you want to be home with your kids too sure but we don't work that much these days you know it's like we, we have like several periods seasonal you know we're working yeah. there then we're working here yeah. so it's not all of the time just on the form issue i just was reading this in his book and i mm -hmm. sort of knew it from listening to his music you know he's not one of these people that's going to repeat the 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 head you know played at the beginning and at the end you know his forms are quite unpredictable is my understanding well not only that it's like uh he wants to have fun and he doesn't consider repetition that fun i mean yeah not that you know repeating a section to solo over is fun yeah but almost there are certain tunes that have really become a part of the core repertoire that we like to play and those tunes once pretty much the form remains the same when we play them but a lot of pieces uh every time we have a gig we'll rehearse and change the form hmm. and we'll try nice. something different yeah it's like, well, you know, we're, we're not going to do the same people solo on this one we're going to do it this way yeah we're going to start with this other section or i had an idea uh-oh and we had an idea <laughs> you know like get ready i mean he yeah. did that one time we were playing you know he he, he did the uh, chicago jazz festival in millennium Millennium Park, I believe. Double Bill with Brad Meldow. And they played before us, the Brad Meldow mm -hmm. trio. And they were great, you know. And then we go out. A lot of people there. I want to say 4,000. I'm not sure exactly uh -huh. how many people. But right before we go on, he goes, hey, you know what I want to do? Blah, blah, blah. And I forget exactly what it was, but it was one of the tunes, and he wanted to change the form. And all of us are standing there with our horn, you know, got the music, and, like, we're looking at each other like, wait, what? You know, like, that's going to be, like... Isn't this hard enough? Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. It's like, come on, man, what are you trying to do? And 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 you know, but the, but but so we do it. And of course, you've got five people on stage. What are the chances that somebody's going to forget that that conversation happened? Uh huh. You know, because <laughs> it wasn't on the first tune that we played. Right. So that did happen. You know, and there was this like moment of kind of ten tentative right. understanding. But because we've been together for so long, right. it's just like, mm, you know, and then we yeah. all figure, oh, yeah, you know, so yeah, yeah. whereas in another situation that could have been a train wreck. So, yeah. and, but that's part of the fun. And Henry, in a way, it's like, oh, well, he knew that was going to happen. Interesting. And that's okay because the other quality Henry has is he has no fear of failure. Right. So doing something Very exciting and getting in front of 4,000 people and had, making a mistake is not an issue for him. Yeah. And just think about that for a minute, how terrified people are of like playing a wrong note. Oh, I played the wrong chord here or whatever. Yeah. You know, you want to make the music happen, but there are so many things about performing music that are important and it's not always perfection. You know, I mean, you don't want something to be sloppy or unrehearsed or mm -hmm. mediocre, 
Yeah. But you also want to make sure you have a lot of passion. <clears throat> yeah. And excitement. Absolutely. And and we really creates that, you know. So so it, yeah. It's a, it's an honor to be able to do that. And the, the other thing I know just from talking with him is, you know, he's kind of a brilliant conversationalist and that you hear his in his music what it's like talking to him. Right. You know, he, he has a, a just a way with a pithy statement or a way of thinking about something like, wow, I never would have thought of, thought of it that way. And he also has very strong opinions about stuff and his music mm -hmm. is very strongly about what he believes and what, what, what he's learned. Well, like I said, his personality really does come through in, yeah. in his pieces, you know, yeah. so that's, you know, and, and again, I mean, I, I guess that's harder to do than some people think it is, you know, allowing your personality to really inhabit your music on a certain level. As opposed to sort of just learning the craft of writing and just doing it by craft, you know. Like, well, I think I think that's a really interesting question, and and one thing that I think about is how does somebody become what we years later may term a visionary? Like, what is it that made them say, "I'm just gonna, this is who I am. I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm sticking to this." I'm not bending or bowing whatsoever. You know, somebody like Anthony Braxton also. And um, we, we could talk about that, you know, all day and night and, and not mm -hmm. answer the question. Right. But, right. But, but I think those people are inspiring to us because they were willing to have the courage to say, I see the world differently and I'm going to live by that. I don't care what happens. If I go broke... You know, if I don't work, well, you know, that's that. I'll, I'll live with it. But I, yeah. I, those people have to do it. There's no real choice when you're that type of person. Yeah, I, that's probably true. I mean, I don't know if I'm that kind of person myself. I mean, I try to be. You know, I'd like to be. You know, but I mean, it's like uh, I think. Well, a lot you know, of us like to go part time there. Well, I think I just think it's a different time too. I mean, the yeah. demands and the fractured focus that people have now I mean you know I can't you know imagine coming up in the 60s as a new musician or in the early 70s and you know not having the internet and not having access to all the world's music at the same time and trying to pick what you're interested in you know yeah. it's like you're interested in whatever moves you and also what you've seen I mean like you know like you talk about Henry's book and you know uh, his history being being in Chicago and seeing all the legendary musicians who come through there yeah. but it wasn't like you're seeing edm concerts <laughs> yeah. and then you know philip glass thing and then you're seeing you know bjork and then you're seeing you know muddy waters or you know it's not that random the way people are now yeah so you have this focus of black music and you know r&b serious blues music and then mm. you're seeing coltrane and duke ellington people like that and so um you have let you have, you have smaller window of what you maybe think you're supposed to be in, and then if you're not in that, you're then what are you in? Yeah. And so Henry, I think that's what he talks about. Like I, you know, they weren't trying to just be bebop players. So yeah. if you're not doing that, and you're not just playing blues or an R&B or whatever, then you're doing your own world, and the world is open. Yeah. And so there's something freeing, in it, <laughs> of course, and also very challenging. But so I think uh, we're talking about this more but i think there's going to be probably more books written and conversations had about a handful of african-american composers and improvisers of that era mm -hmm. who much more than your average musician staked out improbable and unique territory and and just had this kind of brilliant unusual way of looking at the world um Wadada, henry braxton and three people from chicago mm -hmm. um steve coleman younger and um it's just very interesting in reading henry's book to get a little bit of a sense of how that happened mm -hmm. because it you know the music can be rather um formidable for a lot of listeners and you're like wow how did this happen you know even for me and i i listen to a lot of music but then when you actually 
This is what I love about the book. Read about what formed him. Mm -hmm. Then you go, oh, that's, I, you know, I hear the parades. Mm -hmm. about how he was, became like really dug deep into Scott Joplin's music when mm -hmm. he was younger. Mm -hmm. um, his refusal to play bebop, like, no, I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. I, and he would get hired for bebop gigs and then refuse to play like a bebop player. And people would be like, that's cool, go ahead and do that. Which not many <laughs> right. people can get away with that. Just all these, mm -hmm. these choices, not to mention that you understand that from a very young age, he was just radical. Even his mother would talk about, you know, why do you have to be so contrary and different all the so time? I think so extreme. Think extreme is the word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, look, I can't answer that. Those, of course, that, no. This is this is a way too much to put know? out in, into the universe. That, yeah, I mean, that's not really for me to say. But, I, but you know, like all, all I can say is that I'm really thankful for the opportunity to work with somebody so closely for so long, and try to use him as an inspiration. Not, not. I mean, I do. I think for me, it's affected me, especially the stuff we talked about with his form and. Mm. being willing to sort of experiment yeah i hear um, it in your music for I, sure. I definitely take that to heart you know but i'm not trying to 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 just take what i've learned from him and do that in my own music yes but but i do want to stay try to stay true to myself and learn the lessons of being unafraid you know and mm. that, that that's really i see that some of the most you. inspiring stuff but but you know like uh you know, it's a different time now, and I mean, the, the level of musicianship is so high. Yeah. Um, but I don't think it's gotten any easier to be motivated from the inside as to be a really pure artist. You know, mm. like that hasn't the internet hasn't made that easier. There's more information to educate yes. yourself, but I wonder. It may have made it harder. I wonder what that's yeah. like to be to be still really in the early forming stages and have so much information and Reactions. not know what to latch on to because yes. how could you you know even just for like even if you're just inspired by say you're a good young guitar player and you're inspired by all these great players you could study any one of them and it would take you forever yes you know so it's like you know um it's a daunting amount of choice yeah yeah, um, yeah. like looking at an empty page and saying quick write something wonderful you know it's like, uh <laughs> yeah What's my first note going to be? I guess yeah. I'll start with a C, you know? Like, yeah. You know, like, <laughs> Got to start somewhere. Yeah. Um, let's talk about um, some more um, specifically musical stuff. If you wouldn't mind picking up the guitar, uh, I want to ask you to do something for us. Um, one of the things that, and again, we've known each other for 30 years or so, and I always sort of singled out Liberty in my mind as somebody with a strong groove. And I found out last night that your father was an important drummer. You grew um, up with a father who had who was a drummer. He had great your father had great time. So, yeah. so you know, things don't happen by accident usually. Um, well, I don't know. I think it has I mean talent every you know, talent's always important, whatever, but I think it's you know, having good time it's like what I said before, I think it's you have to want to listen to everyone else while you're, you know, you have to be able to, to think about what you're doing and listen to everyone else and work with them. Mm. And that's where time is really about. I mean, sure, you can play by yourself and have a good time, you know, um, but you learn you to improve your time by juxtaposing what you're feeling and playing against other yeah. rhythms. Like for example, I'll be listening in my own head. If I'm playing by myself and I'm not playing with a metronome, um, I'll be imagining, imagine you've got Elvin Jones playing <laughs> or right. something. And a lot of times I'll be sitting there and I'll be playing something and I'll just be hearing like, right. and so, and I'm always imagining that, that that rhythm element is there. I mean, they used to say, I forget who said this about Monk, but that like, you know, their feeling about his time would be like he could play 12 bars of music and then walk out of the room and come back in and nothing would have changed. He'd be right there in the form and boom, you know, like, mm. um, meaning this is that you have the internal monologue of rhythm. Yeah. That yeah. keeps you up at night. Yeah. <laughs> the drummer's always there when I'm trying to sleep. Yeah. But, 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 you know, but, but, but you, you work on it. 
you have to work on it. You know, you have to yeah. either play with really great drummers and let them tell you where the time is and don't try to play on top of them and mm -hmm. push, don't pull them to you, you know, go to where they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. And this, that's what a metronome is for to help you get used to doing that. Yeah. You know, a lot of people don't want to play with a metronome sometimes and, and, uh, you know, maybe there's can be diminishing returns if you're a fetishist about it. But I think, you know, being honest about where your groove is, yeah. where you play in the eighth note, because it's different. You know, everybody has a slightly different way of feeling the groove. And mm -hmm. so to be a good rhythm player, one has to be able to translate someone else's groove and fit it with yours. Yeah. And that comes from listening. You, yeah. just, you have to listen. Yeah. So speaking of listening, let, right. let's do a little experiment here. I'm going to play a, an incredibly simple outline in 5-4. Okay. So I'll be playing something so simple that it, it, it'll just mark time so people know where we are. So I, I, I'm saying that because in this experiment, it's not like we're jamming together. Okay. It's like I'm, I'm going to be a metronome if I can. Okay. <laughs> and, and just because we do... You, we right. do this all the time anyway when we're playing. You like you'll start playing some rhythmic thing, and I'm like, "Wow, that's really cool." Okay. But I rarely stop to, <laughs> to ask you what you're doing. So, so let, let's take one of the simplest odd times, which is five, uh -huh. and and let let me just do something like like this: one, two, three, four, five, and and just play some of your like hear that drum in your head and play some of your you know, cool rhythmic stuff that you do and just have some fun. I don't know, it's a lot of pressure, Joel. I'll try. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. I'm not sure it's so cool, but... Um... <laughs> So all I'm right. So all I'm trying to do is feel the pull. I'm not doing anything. I'm just playing pentatonic G minor. Yeah. But I'm just listening to your pulse. I'm not even. I'm not counting at that point. What I'm doing is listening to your pulse, and I'm just trying to play these dotted things and feeling the pull of my time against your time. You know what I mean? And I felt the tension. <laughs> it's so beautiful. But yeah. I think there's something else that you're e excellent at that comes into learning this, and mm -hmm. that is you know very clearly where every eighth note is. So it has nothing to do with, with where the, the downbeat is per se, it's just the grid is always there. And in African music, of course, it, it, the one is the last thing that you're gonna hit. So when I hear you're going, the first thing you did was you know, off, right. beautiful offbeats with precision because you're, you're, it's, there's never a doubt where the subdivision is. Okay, well, do the same thing again, right? So basically, if you're playing, so I, I'm identifying, obviously you're playing G and D, right? right? And so, uh, first, if I'm hearing what you're doing and I go, two, three, four, five, right? That's all you're doing, right? right? And so, so then the first thing is that, like, I don't know what kind of rhythm that is. I know it's in five. But right. it's, it's not necessarily a swinging rhythm. Right. I hear that as a groove, quote unquote. Right. Very simple groove. So for me, I fell into the, that sort of yeah. syncopated dotted rhythm thing because that's what it feels like. It's great. So, but then you know, so but the thing is, is like knowing what subdivisions are, right? Right. Right. So if you're just playing two. So, 
Well, because so so what did I do? First, I just played eighth notes. Yeah. Then I played triplets. But then what I'm doing is playing. Okay, well, what about the other syncopations that really make up most of our music, which would be like sixteenth notes. Mm -hmm. So first, it's like if I'm thinking one two three four one two three four one two three four. That's the second sixteenth note, right? Yep. Then there's dun 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 the fourth sixteenth note right before. Critical. You know what I mean? So it's like, but yeah. knowing like, but see that, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people, I mean, you think that's really easy. No. But when you're sight reading music, the, <laughs> it's so funny to me that what people mess up the most, for example, is rest. Mm. A lot of times, you know, they're playing a piece of music and then uh, they are in such a hurry to get to the next right note on a downbeat mm. that they rush the rest, mm. you know, or they don't play the last note for its full value. Yeah. It's like that note is a quarter note, then there's a rest, and then you come in. Right. And what if you have a quarter note and a rest, and then you're supposed to come in on the second, 16th note of the next beat? Yeah. But you're rushing, and then other people have music that's related to that, and you're not in the right place because you actually didn't count the rest. Right. And I think people take for granted how hard it is to actually rest in the right place. <laughs> you know, it's very interesting. Yeah. Well, you to, know, but to, just to kind of back up you, obviously mm -hmm. you could do this in four four i mean i've told students yeah it doesn't have to be that time. you, you know, a lot of times it's just, that it's just you know you practice you know, if the metronome metronome is on mm -hmm. and you nice slow tempo you practice just playing the, the second 16th note of a group of four 16th notes mm -hmm. until you're just really sure then the offbeat which is the third 16th note and then the the fourth one and you know, if you can really do that accurately, you're a long ways towards having a good time. But that's what, like, all those rhythms are so apparent when you talk about funk music and but whatever. Do it again, I mean, uh, but, but this time 4-4, four, four. all right? One, two. Well, here, I'm going to do this. Watch this. One, two. So what I'm doing there is I'm playing the second and fourth, right? Uh -huh. get, get, yep. get, 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 but like, you know, right? Like, like, yeah. I mean, that's just basic syncopation stuff, you mm -hmm. know, but, but, um, it doesn't matter. I mean, yeah, you were asking about odd times earlier and I, I guess, you know, to me, it has nothing to do with whether or not what time fix you're in. It really yeah. just has to do with being comfortable in subdivisions of notes and with your, sense of syncopation right and then you know it's more habit you know feel fine if you're i mean these days every young musician i know seems to be pretty comfortable with odd times now but you know it's um it's just a habit you know a lot of jazz musicians right. pl playing in four four and three four more often right and so they have vocabulary that lines up in that yeah um but you know the more players who have been who've been doing that you know and like i said i mean pretty much everyone on the scene in new york can do that with no problem right. though but i mean it's like uh you know it's just about extending that vocabulary and feeling comfortable with those groupings of three plus two or yeah. four plus three you yeah. said five is easy i actually find five harder than seven i feel like mm -hmm. like there's something that requires a little more focus for when i play five hmm. whereas seven it just feels so natural like the four and then the three you know or three and four, depending on what you're doing. Right. Um, yeah. But uh, if you're trying to learn to play odd times, there's nothing that you can do other than practice. You know, yeah. just like everything, you know, you have to put the time in and just, you know, uh, play with other people who know how to do it. Yeah. And uh, and do that. But but in terms of improving, improving your time really just has to improve your relationship to the beat. I mean, yeah. that's really what good time is. You know, like yeah, not the intellectual part, but just sure. That feeling that you said you were feeling, um, feeling that pull, yeah, and and making sure that you know where you are, right, and that you know that where I fit against what you're doing is right, yeah, and that feeling of that pull is what you want to feel. Well, there's an incredible discussion, of course, that you know uh, some people have had. Um, you can find find information on this. It's probably too big for us to discuss right now about you know, developing your own internal clock and what that takes and that's what something I had to work on a lot I mean for me to not shift over to your subdivision I have to be sure of my internal clock mm -hmm. and th that right there is a life's work 
as well, especially in jazz, because if a you know fast tempo is going by and people are all playing on the off beats and drummer's not showing you where one is. I know. You, well, it can be a little. Yeah, that's woo. that's there. There's nothing. That's good work to do. Yeah, it can be kind of frustrating sometimes if you're playing with someone. The thing it's so interesting. Like for example, take someone like Tyshawn Sorry. It's amazing. You play with Tyshawn, and he can do all these complicated things, but you, it's like you always know where the beat is mm. because his time is so strong and his information is so creative and actually related to the music. Mm. It's, it's just such a fine line, you know, yeah. but it's like, or, you know, play with Damien Reed and it's like, you know, he can outlay every subdivision so precisely that it's hard to get lost, you yeah. know, like, but, but backing up, if you, you know, there's one thing that, that makes it, that I show people sometimes to practice something like that. For example, um, here's something where I'm playing a five over four kind of a rhythm and mm -hmm. it helps you kind of hear some of the subdivisions. Okay. Um, and I don't, I will, you know, we don't have to explain exactly what each note is doing. Right. But, uh, you know, if it's like, uh, uh, let's see. count four and then five so people can see that all right so but but the subdivision is four you know you're playing five sixteenth note groupings yeah so it's one two three four one two three four one two three four one two three four one two ah okay right yeah so Not that it's easy, but it's, <laughs> yeah, it's but it's good, but it's, but the thing is, it helps you with with you know it's not really about the odd time as much as it is with experimenting with how yes. your subdivisions can move across beats. Yeah. And, and and if you do it, you know, if I separate the notes a little more, it might be easier to hear what I'm doing. I'll try yes. it like. to you and part of me isn't because if I'm I have to stay with well, what I know and 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 I'm doing that by subdividing 
into 16th notes myself. So I'm, I'm going, that helps me. If I just go one, two, three, four without hearing that 16th note, it's way easier for me to shift. And right. Draw. Yeah, well, yeah, you have to have your internal tempo um, grid guiding you. Yeah. And you have to be confident in that, you know. But it also, when you understand what the other person is doing and you know what that feels like, then it doesn't throw you because... Yeah. Which I don't quite yet with right. that. Because, because, because that's... You know, you know, so you don't, you know, what you're not saying is, isn't, is that person doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And then you're trying to move to that. Yeah. Because they're not. Yeah. They're playing across what you're playing. So you yeah. just, you know what your part is, but you have to know what their part is too. Yeah. And that's, you know, a lot of what playing more complicated interlocking rhythms is about is the understanding of how they fit together. relationships well right. it tells me what we just did tells me a little bit by the way Liberty has many great CDs under his own name too mm -hmm. most of them at least recently pie recordings mm -hmm. and right. it tells me a little bit about your compositions because what we were just doing there I recognize as a feeling I get listening to some of your pieces like right. wow what's going on here that's yeah. interesting well yeah and, right. and it, those relationships are i think part of what s stamp your music as uh, original well you know I, I i think i've got my own vibe let's say you know yeah. but i mean everything i've learned from learning listening to other people and working with other people so you know i can't claim that it's all original but but uh that is how i write a lot of my music though is like yeah. i'll sit down and i'll play stuff like that uh -huh. and then I might put it into the computer and then play against what I've done but I always you know for me it's always about making sure that it's fun to play yeah it makes sense and that it's grooving yeah. you know what I mean yeah. so I don't tend to write you know sometimes if I'm on an airplane or, a, or in a hotel room and I just I can get into a zone and start just writing on the laptop and uh -huh. you know doing stuff but um, in general I like to write on the instrument you know, mm -hmm. or even at a piano you know yeah. Um, so just briefly before we close, so we talked about <clears throat> rhythm stuff, but is there some way to talk about how working with Henry has affected your harmonic choices? Just in, not only in your own music, but just, just, you know, how you've developed your sound because you do make, I think, some unique choices that I, you know, I just know that it's your influences. Um, I can hear them in there. Mm -hmm. Is it something? I, I, remember, I know it's a little bit unconscious, maybe hard to talk about, but well, I I mean, I don't know. I I think because I don't use. I have experimented with using some of the interval system that Henry uses in my own composing, just as an exercise, trying mm. to figure out. And there's, on my last record, there's one piece, uh, Last Desert Number no. Two, which has a section which does use uh, a bit of that style yeah. of harmony. Um, and what's interesting about it, it's different than, you know, when we do it with Henry, because um, we've been learning Henry's language for 20 years, um, you know, those of us who've been in the band the whole time, and like the, the way we interpret that music is a different kind of uh, quality to it than when I give it to other musicians who haven't been doing that, of course. So, but what's interesting about it is the same underlying function of that, which is like, here, I'd like you to take this piece of music, which looks different than all the other music you've been playing lately, you mm -hmm. know? And I would say a lot of people that I work with are doing all kinds of stuff, so everything is with a grain of salt in some way. Yeah. But just to make them play a little differently, which like the most simple version would be if I give somebody a sheet full of two five ones, the first thing they do is start playing their vocabulary. Yes. And that can be great. I like doing that. It's okay. But what I'm saying is if you give somebody something different, then they have to either analyze it and figure out what's happening or they have to come up with some other thing or rely on their ear more. Mm -hmm. And it just gives a slightly more spontaneous spontaneous kind of vibe mm -hmm. yeah and absolutely. That, and that can give you that that can have that effect of changing the and music i think that's it. you know something that's always needed and welcome in um the the world we live in where people are being presented challenges to get out of the box mm -hmm. you know, we, all, we all create our boxes and we need to be challenged 
with other ways of trying to improvise. It, it builds builds our character. <laughs> Speaking of improvising, um, yeah. uh, I'm going to put you on the spot. And would you mind just doing a short improvisation before we close? And we'll just end with that. Just improvise something? Just improvise something. You're very good at this. I don't know. <laughs> That's all very subjective. Uh, today and um, again check out Liberty's music uh, there's a lot of great stuff out there and also a lot of projects where you're playing as a side man with mm -hmm. Myra Melford and Somi and a lot of different stuff and also again my Patreon page Guitar Unlimited and the YouTube channel for the Alternative Guitar Summit where you can find more content like this alright thanks for listening thanks Joel <laughs>